Is this angle okay? Yep. Okay. Good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for their hard work this semester and hope the end of the semester is treating you well. I know this is a difficult time to be here, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this afternoon, we have the opportunity to hear Kevin Gobert's professorial lecture titled Weather and Code, Building Tools, Visualizing Data, Engaging Students. And this title has me extremely excited because data visualization is the best. Kevin's path to full professor represents the very best of Valpo. Why do I say this? Kevin was a superstar undergraduate in the meteorology department here at Valpo, graduating in 2003. So he's a young man. While he was an undergraduate, he was heavily involved in both academically and in the arts. Kevin went on to earn his master's in 2006 and his PhD in 2009 from the University of Oklahoma. Boomer Suter. <laughs> My father in law is a corn husker, so. Yeah, we all have a cross to bear, right? Uh, he, a, at the University of Oklahoma, a leader in the field of meteorology. He earned promotion to associate professor in 2015 as he, and has embodied the leader servant model during his time at Valpo. Kevin earned strong support for promotion to, for his promotion to full professor. Kevin's teaching is particularly strong. He uses hands-on experiments, flipped classrooms, develops new courses, revises even his most successful courses, and mentors meteorology students while on campus and beyond. He consistently retools his skills, both through on-campus training and through active engagement in his professional organizations. Reviewers specifically noted his infusion of Python, an extremely useful coding language, as emblematic of his commitment to make sure meteorology graduates are second to none. Colleagues noted Kevin's course innovations, developing a writing mini course before the university developed WIC or WID requirements, while also developing courses like physical meteorology that leave Valpo's graduates better prepared for the job market. Kevin's scholarship and creative works also earned considerable praise. In addition to teaching Python, Kevin's involved in something called MetPy. Did I say it right? Today. Okay. MetPy, which is a coding project specifically developed, developed for the atmospheric science community. His chair noted he's developed well over 40 separate coding modules that allow not just the professional community, but anyone to research and visualize atmospheric data. Kevin is also an active presenter at professional conferences and has published a number of peer reviewed articles. He is currently developing an online textbook. You are also likely familiar with Kevin's extensive and impressive service to the university, though I will also mention his service to his profession. Kevin has served on CCPC faculty grievance, the honor council and faculty senate. He chaired the faculty senate served on the President's Council, served as the faculty representative to the Board of Directors Academic Affairs Committee. He also co-chaired the committee that developed our strategic plan and is co-chairing its implementation. His service to the university is simply unparalleled. Kevin also has or had leadership roles in the American Meteorological Society, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, and the Symphonia Education Foundation. You'll note the final organization is a music focused organization and I have it on good authority that Kevin is a wonderful singer. Perhaps he will treat us at some point today, but no pressure. <laughs> on a personal note, I worked closely with Kevin while on faculty senate. Kevin regularly demonstrated his love of Valpo his patient with the administration, faculty, and students, exceptional organizational skills, and even his ability to tolerate my nonsense. So I'm excited to be here to celebrate Kevin's well-deserved promotion to full professor. Please join me in congratulating Professor Kevin Gilbert. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Bagel, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, 
So yeah, uh, when I was trying to think about what am I going to talk about for this professorial lecture, um, you know, it took me a while to think about what should I do because I've done a whole lot and could go down a lot of different paths. But um, ultimately, I came down on this idea of talking about code, and so we're going to see that in a couple of different ways today. But before I get into that, uh, I want to do a few uh, acknowledgments first. Make sure my slides advance here. Uh, and so uh, ultimately, none of this work could be possible without um, uh, Unidata, which is a, a part of uh, the UCAR University of Corporation for Atmospheric Research, and my collaborators on MetPy that you're going to hear more about today. Uh, that's been uh, a wonderful uh, thing that's developed uh, since I was promoted to uh, associate professor. Uh, I have to acknowledge my students who are often my guinea pigs for a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So for better or worse, they uh, were subjected to some pain maybe about this. Um, definitely my colleagues who have fostered my ability to innovate and let me uh, try things, fail things, fail at things, and then uh, find new ways of doing things. And then, of course, uh, my family who is uh, here with me today, my mother, and my father, and my sister for uh, helping me, um, you know, encouraging my passions. When I probably mentioned meteorology, they probably went like, what? And three degrees later and 15 years now in, in teaching, uh, still doing it and still loving it every single day. And of course, uh, my lovely wife who's here today who puts up with me coding on the weekends, sitting on the couch um, and spending endless hours uh, doing uh, something that I love uh, and supporting me. And as you can see from this picture uh, is somebody who's able to just make me laugh uh, when I especially need it most when I get in my own head. So thank you all for being here today, including friends and colleagues and everybody here assembled. Uh, I greatly appreciate you taking the time here today. All right, so where we're gonna start with a definition. Uh, one of the things I like to do in class is often do word association. We're not gonna do word association, not gonna do audience participation here today. But um, you know, when you think about code, uh, a lot of people think about different things and there really are a whole bunch of different elements. And so there are two main definitions that you can read for yourself here. One is about just representation of, of things with other things, whether that's words, objects, symbols. And then of course, computer programming. And so we're gonna to touch a little bit on both here today and see kind of where they intersect and where they've intersected for me uh, over the course of, of my career. And so we're gonna start off with just a little bit about weather codes. So back in the day, right, we had we've been collecting meteorological data for, for a very long time, but how do we communicate all that data and communicate it efficiently, right? Before the internet, before radio, before even, um, Telegraph, right? All those types of things. And so there was, the bandwidth was very, very limited. So how do we communicate all this information? Well, we had to take all this information we collect, put it into some sort of shorter code so that we could then ship it out in those small little bytes and then reassemble it later. And so we're gonna talk about a couple of different types of weather codes. And we're gonna start out with something relatively easy that most everyone will be common with, uh, cloud names. Then we're gonna move on to some weather map stuff. We are gonna talk about some equations here today, very briefly, and we'll move past that slide very quickly, so don't worry about that. METAR, TTAs, weather symbols, and then uh, a little bit more on programming codes. So when thinking about codes, one of the things I was really thinking about, like everything in meteorology, right, is a symbol for something else. And so one of the classic ones is this idea of cloud names. Now, cloud names we did not get until 1803. Before 1803 and Luke Howard, an English alchemist who gave us the Latin names that we use today for our clouds, we didn't have them. We didn't have a way of talking about them. So often in, in reported uh, meteorological reports, it would be, we had wispy clouds, we had thick clouds, we had bubble clouds, very generic terms. And how could you really relate those things to each other? And so we had to come up with a code in order to allow everybody to have a common vernacular there. Again, representing these things that can take on many shapes and forms are clouds. And so you can see, you know, all the different cloud names that we use here today. Uh, you may have your own favorite ones. I know a lot of students in here, probably the cumulonimbus CV clouds there going for you. Others like the good farewell of the cumulus. Some, you know, may like nimbostratus that produces frozen precipitation. God help them. <laughs> so that's one type of code that we have in meteorology. Uh, the other is surface maps, right? Surface maps are in code. I look at this map, I see a lot of different information. Some of you probably look at this map and go, I don't know what's going on there, right? And so what we're doing is we're representing lots of information. The idea to map weather data did not really come into the fore until 1816. It's amazing that we did not have maps representing current data. Now, one of the reasons might be is Communication was a little hard back in, in the, the 19th century there, right? How was that data collected? Largely by mail, right? You had to mail in your, your observations or you just collected it and somebody doing research would collect them then over a course of a year and then take a whole nother year and analyze that data. 
but we represent lots of data over a spatial domain here with our surface maps, another type of code. I don't think I have any pressures listed on here because that would even be in a, in a different code. But Morse code, again, another code here intersecting with meteorology, revolutionized the way that we can access information, weather information specifically. And so it was proposed in 1846 that we could use the telegraph lines to then quickly disseminate and distribute weather data across the country. It was the first time that in the United States we could quickly gather information from the Rocky Mountains uh, through uh, to the East Coast and then be able to immediately put it on a weather map. This came into to, um, more of a grand scale here in the Civil War era at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., where they, they were collecting all that information. It was coming into the Smithsonian, and they would map it up and literally put it on a placard outside the Smithsonian Institution so that you could see what the weather was like across the country. We weren't really forecasting yet, as we would commonly say, but people could look at that, see what was happening around us, and they might then surmise what might happen over the next day or two. And it was in 1871 when the U.S. began uh, plotting daily weather maps. And so this is the first uh, daily weather map from January 1st, 1871. Uh, you can see that there weren't a whole lot of stations. I know it's probably a little hard to read. Uh, and they don't quite use the, the current vernacular that we use for, for plotting surface data. But since 1871, we've been plotting surface weather maps every single day. And you can actually go and find any weather map you want. So if you're curious about what was the weather like on the day you were born, you can go, go ahead and find that here. All right, so we've got cloud names, we've got surface maps, we've got uh, Morse code helping us to distribute this data now. Then we've got our equations. Here are our wonderful seven equations that describe all of atmospheric motion. If you're interested in learning about this, I know a few good meteorology classes you could take from me and my colleagues. Uh, and then uh, in NWP, you can figure out how we discretize these to then you know, use them to predict the future. And then that gets into a whole nother set of coding. We're gonna move on from the equations now. But we get to things like this then. All right, here's another set of code. Now there's a few people in the audience who might be able to, to read this and a, a few sophomores I see sitting in the audience might wanna brush up on this for a final exam that might be coming up here. Uh, can decode what's going on here. So what's going on here, this, this is a certain type of, of code that we have that then is able to uh, quickly and, and, and in small chunks distribute upper air information. Right, so we launched weather balloons and have launched weather balloons since the 1930s across the entire United States and then really across the world. But back in the 1930s, again, we had better uh, abilities to communicate data, but we still only had small packets that we could do. We couldn't you know, stream, you know, the amount of video that we stream now like, is amazing compared to what we had to do. But we wanted to be able to distribute this, this data worldwide so that we could actually benefit from it. And so these, these two codes represent different uh, information about the vertical a uh, structure of temperature and moisture in the atmosphere. And so if you're able to decode this data, you could then generate an image that looks something like this called a QT image, right? Uh, representing uh, this data. So that data that you saw on the screen, this is the image that it actually creates. Okay, so that's another type of code. Well, it's QT, I guess that's even another type of code, right? Codes just abound here uh, in meteorology in various ways. And of course, we would be remiss if we left off the METARs, the good old METAR codes. Uh, anybody who flies, you should thank METAR code because pilots must review METARs before they fly. And this is really an aviation-based product here. And this is telling you all about what's happening at a particular station at the surface, okay? This is one station, one time, KVPC. This was uh, a uh, observation from November here, uh, right in town at uh, 2156 UTC on the 26th of November. But you're like, how? I can't read all that, right? That's what our sophomores learn, and then we use it again. But we can decode it, and so we can decode it both uh, as observations. So you can see that the temperature was 9.4 uh, degrees Celsius, dew point was minus 1.1, or we could put that in the station model that we plot on our station maps. Again, we're reading data to put into code, using code to distribute that data, and then putting it in other codes to, to then disseminate that information in a different way to understand what's going on in the atmosphere. So again, codes are just abounding uh, within meteorology. We also have different ways of representing different current weather. You may find your favorites up there. Maybe it's the uh, you know, freezing rain, maybe it's freezing drizzle, maybe it's four star snow for some of us in the audience. Um, maybe it's the thunderstorm symbol uh, down there at uh, 90, you know, different ways of, of representing all different types of weather. Again, in a succinct way so we can plot it on a map because we wanna be able to see things over the span of, of a region. And then of course, 
getting us back to our maps, right? Plotting things like fronts, which you may all more recognize from your uh, time watching the, the TV weather. This is from uh, today's um, National Weather Service uh, forecast map here, uh, showing areas of precipitation as well as our, our fronts and other symbols going on. So lots and lots of code going on uh, within everything that we do, including our upper air code, finding troughs, ridges, our own station models going on at the upper levels, just everything going on in all sorts of ways. So that's great. So we have all this data. We have different abilities uh, to, to map some of that data, but how do we actually map some of that data? Before computers, everything was hand-drawn. And we still make our students, at least I think Bart still does as seniors, hand draw some surface maps from our station observations to understand what that's like. And you get to know the data in a fundamentally different way when you're actually plotting the data. Most of the time now though, we use computers to generate those surface station plots from reading that data into making our plots. But even when we had early computers, you couldn't do it on your own. You couldn't make maps yourself, right? And this is where uh, Bart talks about his days uh, in the map room where you had these big, uh, sheets of paper rolling off with the latest observations that you'd have to rip off and then you'd put them up on map walls, paper map walls. And then you would use your, your easy method of looping by simply scrolling through the maps by lifting them up and letting them fall down. You can see the evolution of the maps. Again, we weren't able to have personal computers. Even mainframes were not uh, accessible to be able to plot uh, and analyze uh, weather data for the average student. But now we have desktop and laptop computing. And so now we can get all this data on our little device. You could probably even do a lot of it on your phones these days for getting some of this information, decoding it, and then creating your own weather maps. So codes everywhere, they abound. And I probably uh, you know, make some students cry at times versus how much code they have to, to work with and do, not only computer coding, uh, but all these other types of codes that you need to understand to then write other code to understand it, to then plot the data, right? It just kind of revolves around itself. So what I wanna spend most of my time talking about today is my journey to coding. Um, when I started as an undergraduate, I, computing kind of the furthest thing from my mind. My idea of computing was getting the computer on and playing SimCity 2000, right? You know, playing a good uh, computer game and doing something. Uh, and then lo and behold, that I, I find myself now in my career doing a lot of coding and really enjoying it and enjoying uh, the puzzle. And so the, the main questions here around this building tools section is, how do we deal with all of this data? And how do we deal with this data and transform it into either other codes and other data and use it to plot? And so I'm gonna go through a, a little history of, of some of the main ways uh, that I've coded it and then ways that then um, I, I originally coded to then lead into some of the work I do today. So it all started with Fortran. Uh, this was one of my first Fortran programs that I wrote as a student here at Valparaiso University under the tutelage of Teresa Balzelschels. Anybody know Fortran out there will love looking at this very structured. You have to indent seven spaces, columns mean different things, all those sorts of things. It's a lovely language. It's a compiled language though. Uh, and it's not super adaptable for a lot of the things we wanna do, but it was my first foray into coding. Um, and I remember getting homework problems and I just, I couldn't put them down. I would just need to dig in and understand, and, you know, here you had to constantly, you know, amend your code, compile your code, run your code, see an error amend your code, compile your code, run your code. You just had to continually do these things. And of course, then that's where I learned to love VI, which is a text-based, yeah, see, exactly, yeah. Learned some good tools and, and largely I've been teaching my students VI still as well. So, you know, I know exactly, right? Um, so these, these great things, and this is where I, I found an initial love and, and at least uh, kind of part of where my brain just worked this way to then do these, this idea of uh, computer coding languages. Foreign languages, nah, that was not, my brain did not work that way, but it did for computer languages. Why, I don't know, maybe it was about this, this idea of constructing puzzles. And it was around the end of my time at Valpo that uh, Teresa brought this uh, computer program called GEMPAC to the institution. I was a senior at the time and she was introducing it to the juniors. And I remember uh, asking her like, can I get a few of your labs just to, to try it out? I wanna see if I can use this program. Well, I didn't have a whole, bunch of extra time because I tend to get involved in lots of different things. So I didn't really end up doing too much uh, with it uh, during my time as a student. Uh, but then when I went to graduate school um, for my master's degree, I was using GEMPAC to plot a lot of, a lot of data. And that first summer uh, after my first year of graduate school, I still remember the day that I got my first color plot out of GEMPAC. And I was like, 
victory. I'm taking the rest of the day off. It was summer, so I, I took the rest of the day off. But anyway, the GEM pack uh, stands for the General Meteorological Package. This uh, is, was a tool that was developed in the 1980s uh, based off of stuff that the National Weather Service was doing. And so it was meant to be a way that we could develop students within the field of meteorology and atmospheric science uh, in something that they would likely use uh, after, uh, after graduation. There are some challenges uh, with GEMPAC. Uh, you have to have it in what we call GEMPAC format, which requires its own set of decoders and, and taking in and ingesting all this data. And that was getting kind of hard to maintain uh, because our data sets were improving, data set sizes were improving. Maintaining this code base was becoming increasingly problematic. Over the course of my graduate career though, I, I became a GEMPAC super user. Uh, one of the things I did was work with uh, uh, student colleagues at the University of Oklahoma uh, to develop something called the Hoot website. Uh, so they had a local forecasting group called the Oklahoma Weather Lab, OWL. And so then the development side, making maps for them was Hoot, because what do owls do? They hoot. So anyway, um, became a master user there and we had uh, web pages that were operational and it seemed to always break on every major holiday that you had to log in to fix something, uh, as is any of the case with any operational type system. This program that we used at universities was um, more or less developed by Unidata. So Unidata would get the code in from the National Weather Service. They would repackage it for use in the university community as a freeware uh, piece for us. And so this is an example of a map that, that would come out of GEMPAC. Uh, so this is upper air observations uh, with contours drawn by the computer and color fill drawn by the computer as well. And to do this didn't require all that much computing knowledge. A simple shell script could do it. So I got into shell scripting as well. Okay. Oh, this seems pretty good. Okay. You, you set a parameter equal something. And yeah, you got to learn what all those things equal, but it was pretty straightforward to do. And, you know, then you had to run it then you had to exit and then you had a GPEN, always had a GPEN. If you didn't GPEN, you wouldn't create the figure. Many, many times spent wa wasted uh, looking for like, oh, I forgot to GPEN at the end. Right. So this was good. This was something that we could teach students. And so when I was a graduate student, we developed a whole lab course that was based off of this program to generate weather maps, analyze weather maps, and, and go about those sorts of, so, sorts of things. But then news came down. They were going to sunset GEMPAC. Uh, in 2008, NSEP said they were no longer gonna actively develop uh, GEMPAC. They were moving on to a next generation of solution that was not gonna have a, a scripting uh, solution in there. And the community was like, uh, excuse me? You know, this was a, a, a program that was, was um, you know, thought about to be, to be just su such a mainstay of things, right? And so literally the, the listservs that were going on at the time, I mean, it was true crisis mode. Like you're gonna take away this thing that I love. This thing that is the basis of my research for the past 30 years. And part of the problem was we didn't have a ready solution to put in its place. So Unidata Users Committee uh, issued a statement, this was in 2008, that said Unidata will stand behind the latest release of GEMPAC at least until the point where there are alternative packages with the same functionality available to the community. Thank God. That was gonna be painful. But what to replace it with? So remember, that's 2008. Options as of 2010, so this was early on in my time as a faculty member here. Uh, there's this program called GRADS. There was a program called NCL, the NCAR command language, integrated data viewer, IDV, and even Python was around. Python's been around since the late 1980s. But of course, change is just scary and nobody wants to do it. And none of these solutions were really ripe. They weren't ripe for the taking. Some of that had their own quirks or peccadillos, GRADS, uh, was an older program as well that, that uh, required more nuanced knowledge of how that particular program worked. NCL tried to be its own language and anybody who knows anything about computer coding, if you do an if statement, normally you have an if and if you have else if, else if, then you just have one end if. In NCL, you had to have an end if for every if and else if. Oh. Just, it's just bad, just very bad. So there wasn't really anything that fit the bill. So keep calm and carry on is what we all did. And so then uh, in, in 2011, I developed a new course here at Valparaiso University called Weather Technology. Uh, and I developed it using Jetpack because that was still the tool to use. We were still bringing in Jetpack data. It was still being supported by Unidata. So everything was, was great. It was kosher. It was wonderful. 
but during this time, of course, uh, I'm not one to sit around uh, on my laurels. And so I started to, to get into Python first with an initial um, foray uh, in an asynchronous class in 2004, it was a one credit class. I really had no clue what I was doing. I was following some examples. I was making it work. I got it done as I, I learned something, but I didn't really learn a whole lot, but it, it got me into it. Uh, and I found it wasn't too scary. It wasn't too hard of a change from, from Fortran, which is what I really knew at the time. And then over the later course of my graduate school career, uh, I really started using Python a bit more. I used a bit in my dissertation. Uh, my dissertation was a, was a terrible construct of all like five different scripting programming languages to get data, analyze data, port it from one to another, because again, no one tool was the right tool. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot about computing during that time, really fell in love with some of the computing uh, during that time. Um, but Python still was definitely not in a place to be able to, to take it over. And what was the challenge? The challenge really boiled down to the fact that we have very particular data formats, some of which are four letter words to me, grib and buffer. Um, we often have a lack of coherent metadata. What is metadata? Metadata is data about the data, information about the data. So oftentimes the most metadata you get in a metallogical file is in the file name. The date and time is what's contained in the file name and that's how you know when that data is good for. That's not good metadata. And it doesn't allow you to build robust programs. In addition, we have these unique plotting needs, surface station models, right? Not something that any program automatically kind of had. Python didn't, definitely didn't have it. We have this problem of we're trying to plot geographically, right? I guess there's this like globe thing that we got to represent in a 2D plane, and that's not easy. Take a geography class and learn about uh, projections there if you want. We've got geographic-based calculations, meaning that our two grid points may be closer together at certain points and farther away at other points. So got to account for that. So you can't just quickly do differencing, you know, centered finite differencing and do it for all, all points across the globe. We also need something simple enough to use, right? I want to teach this to freshmen. Well, I don't expect freshmen to have great command of, of any programming language, let alone Python. And we also want to produce high quality graphics. And so none of those solutions that we talked about really fit that bill. And so this is where MetPy uh, enters the picture. So MetPy got started uh, in about 2008 uh, from some graduate students at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and it was basically a collection of a whole bunch of good tools that they had built for the work that they were doing. So it wasn't really meant to be for a broader audience at that point. But in late 2015, uh, Unidata, uh, with the hiring of uh, one of the people who originally contributed to MetPy, uh, took up ownership of that module and started active development on it. And so they took on that active development and then started to bring bear, to bear all of these different elements of Python. So Python is kind of this overarching language. It's a very simple, small language. But then there are these packages or modules uh, that fall underneath it that really allow us to do the scientific work and why it's now widely used within the scientific community. Uh, astronomy, big users of it. Uh, biology, big users of it. Again, this is, it's a burgeoning, uh, uh, it's been a burgeoning language for a long time. But what we didn't have was something that specifically spoke to meteorological data. People were just writing their, their own one-offs, right? Oh, I need to calculate vorticity. I'll just you know, write something to calculate vorticity. And so MetPy was, was the, the mechanism through which we could start to compile a whole bunch of them. But even in 2015, it still wasn't ripe yet because this is the code that it would require to create a simple map. Yeah, well, good luck with that. I can't imagine teaching this to a freshman in meteorology major. I really, it's hard to even think about teaching that to a senior meteorology major. Um, so yeah, not quite, not quite good. So through this time, I, I'd gotten involved in the Unidata Users Committee. I was using Python. Uh, the main developer was one of my old buddies from, from graduate school. Um, and so I made my first commits to the MetPy module in 2015. Um, it was simply a documentation update. Basically, I changed some text on the web page. That's all I contributed. But it was the first contribution. And of course, as a scientist and not a computer scientist, the idea of contributing code was very, very, very daunting to me at the time. But they sat with me and it allowed uh, me to, to um, grow and develop. And one of the critical uh, moments for myself was actually my uh, first sabbatical in 2017, where I got to write an NSF grant with a couple of Unidata colleagues and spent uh, the month of April, 2017, uh, working uh, at Unidata. 
Here is when I first started making substantive contributions to MetPy. Uh, there are some calculations that we use, uh, frontogenesis and deformation that I was able to contribute through my uh, work and, and time uh, there. And then right near the end of my time there, me and, and Ryan spent um, an afternoon in one of the conference rooms and kind of conceptualized a way to go from this, which is a lot of basic code that gets reused lots and lots and lots of times, to something that was simplified, something that was more declarative, that looked more like what Gempack used to look like, that would be an easier transition into, into uh, teaching this and learning Python and using Python for, for at least basic meteorological observations and analysis. This was the potential game changer. This was maybe what we've been missing since 2008 to move away from Gempack. And so what got developed uh, primarily by the, the folks at Unidata uh, was something we call the declarative syntax. And so you can see an example here. So to make this image down here, we only required this bit of code to do it. Ah, oh, that seems tangible. I feel like I could teach that to, to an undergraduate student, to a colleague who's, who's not been in the computing realm. And so this first made its appearance in MetPy 0.10, which was released in January of 2019. It took a lot of that complexity and put it into the background, but it wasn't quite yet ready for prime time because we didn't have a lot of functionality there. We could draw some contours, we could plot an image, put some basic titles on it, that was about it. And this is where I really got into to, uh, advancing MetPy and actually contributing code uh, to um, our main, main branch. And so I added elements uh, to do filled contours. Uh, which is a beautiful thing that you see there on the side uh, with wind barbs coming from our, our gridded data as well. And so that's uh, adding a bit in to do that in our declarative syntax. And then adding in, uh, MetPy already had the ability to do um, surface station models, but I wanted to, to bake it in so that we could do it in this simplified syntax. You really didn't have to know all that complexity. And so this got added on uh, by MetPy version 0 0.12 and then allowed us to take the step that allowed us to have this level of complexity in GEMPAC be comparable to that in MetPy. This was now the game changer. I could now take this and incorporate this into my weather technology class. And so it produces then comparable images. And frankly, actually now I much prefer my Python images or the advanced GEMPAC images that I used to create. But these are the two images that would be created from these pieces of code. And so ultimately in uh, January of 2020, I launched this in weather technology using Python and MetPy for the first time. And this is where my students were especially guinea pigs, working out some kinks that we still had in, in the system. Uh, and one of the things I reflect on January 2020, that was of course our pre-pandemic times. I could not imagine trying to use Gempack during pandemic times because it would have required everybody logging in very circuitous route to be able to run the program because it's not something they'd be able to have on their computer. Moving to Python allowed for a web-based solution that we could then utilize and students could still actively code. Right if they had to code at home, we had to get on some Google Meets to then work through processes, but we were able to do it. In January uh, of 2021, we finally released MetPy 1.0. Well, what's so special about 1.0? 1.0 uh, in computer science parlance means stable code, it means that we're not going to artificially change things on you until 2.0. <laughs> and so it was when we released MetPy 1.0 that all of a sudden people started adopting our code and using it. So like the National Weather Service uses some of our code base now, which frightens us greatly. Because <laughs> we're just coding here, right? We, you know, we're making this tool and we think like, oh yeah, it's good, but is it that good? We don't know. We test our code heavily, so we're pretty good with it. But some key elements came about in MetPy 1.0 that really were game changers. Uh, so there's a large Python stack uh, that we use that are contributed to by many people across the world. And really, if you dig into how these packages are supported, you should all be very, very concerned. If you love watching your Netflix, be very, very concerned because there's probably often one or two people who are maintaining this one particular package that if they stop maintaining it, means that Netflix may, may stop working for you because that package is something that's searching for maybe your favorite show or helping to do something. So be very concerned about that and contribute to open software packages or contribute money to programs that support open software packages. End of spiel. 
Um, so X-ray is one of those. X-ray uh, was what we decided to base our data model on. And this really revolutionized our ability to use the declarative syntax with bringing in all that disparate data. Uh, and so that really helped us create these, these nice simplified ways of interacting with things. Uh, we further developed our, the declarative syntax uh, to do more, more things. And all of this really made this a, a substantial progress so that we could really tell our community, this is now ready for you to use as a full on replacement for Gempack. And we had, we had a bit of a celebration in December of, of 2020 when we released 1.0, uh, virtually of course, A, because we're all spread across the country, but B, because it was still COVID time and we enjoyed uh, watching as we pressed a button and released MetPy 1.0, uh, which was really exciting. But of course, work uh, goes on, right? Gempack was actually not built in a day and MetPy for sure isn't built in a day. And one of the things that was an early piece that we knew about, but we didn't yet tackle, was this idea of spherical calculations. This is what we've been tackling for about the past month intensely here. And it turns out that when you're doing calculations on a sphere, there's some peculiarities about that because longitudes get closer together as you get towards the pole. Well, that presents problems when you're using things like wind direction, which wind directions are in components. And now that turning of the sphere actually matters for doing your calculations of things that wind comes into in, in with. Our current release of MetPy uh, is what is in this left-hand image here. And you can see we're not doing it right. Right here, we're, we're crossing the polar region and we definitely don't do things well uh, north of that, that, or north or south of that pole. Like what it, I say that's part of the problem, right? Everything is south of, of the North Pole. But as we've been working and, and what will soon be released, hopefully tomorrow, um, will be our updated version that now includes the correct calculation of all of these calculations so that our difference between what we assume to be correct, and we're assuming it's correct here, GEMPAC, uh, and what we're doing here in MetPy, we see that we have an exact match. So that we're at least representing what was the historical standard bearer uh, within our field for doing those calculations. We're also looking to expand uh, the um, remit of our declarative syntax to include those UT images. Uh, right now we have to use a little bit more of our Bose code to do that. And so uh, hopefully that will be in the offing in, in not too long. And then we got a second NSF grant because some of our calculations um, are not too fast. If you wanted to calculate the amount of, of energy available in, in a column in the atmosphere, uh, you'd currently have to loop over every grid point right now. And if you did a global grid right now, it'd probably take the better part of a day or more to do all those calculations because we can't yet vectorize that code and do it in parallel all at once. And so that's what we're trying to do, trying to figure out ways to use some of the Python tools and other things to then advance that work and make it usable in even more circumstances than we currently do. Plenty more contributions. You can go to our GitHub repository and if you want to contribute code, you'd be more than welcome to. So one of the things that is really um, just we're in awe of is how quickly MetPy has really grown in adoption within the community. We had visions that this might happen someday, but we never envisioned how quickly this would happen. And so these are some statistics as of November of 2022. Uh, there are uh, greater than 20,000 downloads per release, which is amazing to think about. Uh, 32 other packages depend in some way on MetPy. Some of these are large production scale codes. Other are probably just people's code for their dissertation or master's level research. But again, they're depending on us, which again, scares us. Um, but we have now been cited in 47 theses. I think I just heard about one on our call today. So that's now 48 at least uh, as of, um, oh, and that was just in 2022. And you can see some of the others from um, uh, previous years. But really here, uh, what tells the tale here is this MetPy downloads history. And to see it grow, remember, Unidata started developing in 2015. Again, not large uptake yet. Some good functionality, but again, we weren't really hitting a lot of the bases to really make it something that would be a draw for folks. I annotated here where MetPy uh, 0 0.10 was released in 2019. So we see a, a bit more of an uptick. Uh, MetPy 0 0.12, that's when we bring in that declarative syntax in a more substantial way. And then of course, MetPy 1.0. And so we've continued to grow from there. And again, it's just amazing to think about how this has grown from such a small uh, community of folks who were dedicated to developing this tool for the use uh, by the community. And it truly is a, a collaborative effort because. I still am scared to make contributions uh, to code. But what I want to wrap up with today is just a little bit about how I use all these ideas of code, whether it's the code in, in our original sense of things like METAR and TTAAs, uh, to then actually coding to develop uh, visualizations uh, with my students. And so one thing that I uh, have thought about for a long time is, you know, just talking in front of students is probably not the best way to engage them. 
uh, and often giving a PowerPoint presentation, maybe not the best way to engage an audience either, right? But it's, it's what we use in, in our tool set. Um, uh, but what do I do? I try to challenge my students for, first and foremost, and probably all the students in here would be like, have you been challenged? Yes, yeah. Probably a little bit more so than they care for. Maybe sometimes they may even say it's they're being tortured, but you know, it's a challenge. At least that's the way I see it. Um, so I set robust expectations. I push the students to, to go beyond what they think their limits are uh, and ultimately try to envision learning as an active state of being. But then I try to be right there with support. And one of the great things is that since I developed the code, I largely know how it works, but even then I'm still flummoxed at times by some of the errors that we seem to generate, but every error is but a learning opportunity for the future. And so how do I do this? Uh, the primary way I do this is through um, weather technology uh, and specifically using MetPy uh, and the declarative syntax. That course is entirely based around analyzing and visualizing atmospheric data and getting them right in there in that first year so that they have then the rest of their three years to utilize this tool set to be able to ask and answer a whole bunch of really interesting meteorological questions. It is fascinating to see once the students gain just a little bit of skill, what they start to do with it. Uh, last spring, there was a student who was fascinated by hurricanes. And so every opportunity they had, they went and tried to find and, and plot a weather map of some hurricane making landfall in the United States. From Hurricane Andrew in 1992 to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, again, they then on their own took the impetus to go in and do that. Of course, then, you know, they're still learning how to interpret maps. And so not only do they get the chance to, to make maps, but then they print them out and then have to do hand analysis on them or then analyze those fronts uh, or things like that to then further analyze those maps. And so this is uh, very much a passion course for me. Uh, and especially now that we're using Python, it's just amazing to see uh, where we're able to develop. And then sometimes the bugs that we find that then we get to report and then uh, get to contribute some fixes uh, to our code base. But of course, it's not just weather technology uh, or just our declarative syntax. Uh, I teach a course called uh, Meteorological Computer Applications that uh, not every student uh, has to take. Every student has to take my weather technology class. This is the course, though, where instead of just using declarative, we make them go in and learn all that detail. So all that detail to learn how to make the weather maps from all those base Python uh, um, packages, because declarative is never going to have everything. And there's going to be analyses you want to do that go beyond that scope. And so then learning that complexity, going for the full uh, detail and lots and lots of coding, which, you know, some students appreciate, some students appreciate after they graduate and they start to use it uh, in their professional careers. And then I also incorporate it into lots of other courses that I teach, uh, because again, this, this technology is widely used within the field now, and something I want them to be able to use even in ways that are not just writing code for code's sake to contribute to a package or that. So got a couple examples here from two different courses, numerical weather prediction and physical meteorology. We'll start in the right-hand image here. This is something called a Kohler curve, which tells us uh, when we're gonna reach uh, saturation and potentially then have condensation uh, on um, uh, some co cloud condensation nuclei. And so that's an activity we now do in my physical meteorology class. And instead of just plotting that up by hand, which we can do and do all the calculations by hand, Let's use Python and Jupyter Notebooks to help us do those calculations. And then we can make simple changes like changing the solute so that we can change and look at different curves to see what kind of supersaturation we need in order to get activation and get con growth by condensation. Or then we could use it in um, NWP to create simple 1D models. And so this is a simple 1D infection model using just that simple red wave. And that's the true wave. That's what it should look like. And we can learn a little bit about numerics and how the numerics of doing this uh, finite differencing is causing errors within our output, right? And it's a small way to then demonstrate what's happening in our big models. Some of these things like, the, um, like that loop there, I largely generate for students don't make them learn how to code all that to, to do runga cut schemes and forward differencing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're able to use that to again, demonstrate some of these wonderful uh, aspects of meteorology that we can demonstrate with code. So again, this idea of making things active, using them whether in class demonstrations or in homework assignments uh, for, for some of that active learning. We don't need to loop through that again. But this also parlays into research. And over the years, I've worked with a number of different students on various types of research projects. Uh, one here is on extratropical transition research. 
we had some students who wanted to, uh, to do some studies and I, uh, for my dissertation studied stuff in the Southern hemisphere. So I was like, oh, let's study extratropical transition in the Southern hemisphere. Not a lot of people have done it. So we've only looked at one case um, over the years, but in order to do this, you know, yeah, we can make some plots. That's great. That was the easy part here on the, the left-hand side. There's the cyclone up there as represented in the uh, European reanalysis uh, data set. But then we wanted to create something called the phase space diagram to understand what the transition looked like. So tropical cyclones are warm core cyclones. They have different dynamical forcings that, that work on them uh, versus then cold core cyclones, which is the more typical cyclone that we would see here uh, in the Midwest. And so when our cyclones are in this lower right-hand quadrant, that's when they're tropical, it's when they're warm core. And then when they're up here in this upper left-hand quadrant, that's when they're cold core. That's when they're extra tropical cyclones. And so then we wanted to look at how did different reanalyses look for this type of extra tropical transition. And so we were able to recreate these classic graphics using Python. So really need to, to see that and have the students then be able to take ownership of that and then uh, look at the different tracks um, through time to see that. So we found that the ERA-5 did a much better job of representing this extra tropical transition. It was a newer uh, reanalysis uh, data set. So that was, was just kind of cool to see. We've also used Python extensively with my colleague Craig to do lake effect snow research here. Uh, creating a couple of composite soundings here. So again, going back to some of those soundings, we launch weather balloons all the time. And so one sounding we look at a lot is the Green Bay sounding if we're interested in lake effect snow here in Northwest Indiana. And so what we see on this left-hand image here is that, oh, there's some differences between days that were pure lake effect snow events versus other days when we just had what we call system snow or synoptic snow from a low pressure system. And so some of those effects were noticeable uh, and that this was uh, work we did with some students uh, and was uh, subsequently published. Uh, in a more recent uh, paper, we looked at a wind versus shore parallel bands to again, look at the differences there. Not a lot of differences in the thermal structure of the atmosphere, that's the lines here, but we definitely see some differences in the wind structure between those days, oh, which is something we expected to see, but it's nice to see that come out of the data when we were taking in independent data sets to try to verify what was going on in the atmosphere. And so that's just a few of the different ways that I have gone about using code, building code, and engaging our students uh, over the years uh, with these things that I love uh, to see um, how all of this works together to, so that we can better understand and analyze uh, data in the atmosphere. So thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. So now that I bored you with code, do you have any questions? <laughs> Just from personal experience, in building the, the Met High version, you find that there has all you find spots where there have been things wrong in Gen Pack as well. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Just a hunch. Yep. So the question was, did we find anything wrong in Gen Pack when we were building Met Pie? Right off the top of my head, I can't remember things, re remember anything that we found in particular, but we found some unusual ways that they were doing things. And, and we do some things differently. And we're just, then we try to document like, why are we doing it this way versus the way they, they did it there? Uh, for example, one of, the, one of the calculations, potential vorticity, they calculate as a layer average, and then we don't. And so when I was looking at that output to compare them, I'm like, why does this seem like just everything shifted just a little bit? Oh, they're doing a layer average. And like, can't reproduce that in the same way. And so just understanding some of those differences allows us to understand how these calculations are really working to a, a much more fundamental level than, than we did when we started this. But John? We have a lot of students here. So um, the need for effort into writing things that are free for other people to use. There must be some kind of, you know, uh, some benefits from this, right? Oh, sure. That's how it's helpful. How can you encourage uh, students to get the reward for writing code? Oh. Like a DOI or oh, sure, sure. Yeah, thanks. So the question was, how do you get rewards for contributing to things that are publicly available? And so uh, one of the neat things about MetPy is not only MetPy itself has its own DOI, uh, but that then we've written a, a paper about it as well for, for that particular way. Um, to some extent, you know, it is it's intrinsic motivation, you know, int intrinsic reward for contributing to these things that are then uh, utilized um, well throughout the community. Uh, but one of the things that I can say is that, you know, a large part of my promotion packet was on contributing here uh, to MetPy because this is my, my scholarly work uh, because 
this is going to reach a lot more people than any paper I will ever write, uh, for sure, because um, I still can't believe how much this, this gets utilized. So, And it's one of those ways that you can spread your knowledge to the world by offering these things up uh, publicly. So a lot of my teaching resources, I also post to GitHub, and lots of people are now using them. And I was visiting with a colleague in, in October when I was out in uh, um, Colorado, and uh, we were talking about MetPy and the maps I make, and he's like, Oh yes, I, I know when I see a Kevin Gobert map out there now, because uh, my maps are pretty ubiquitous in the color schemes I use, the way I do titles and something like that. He's like, I know your mark now. So I guess that's good. <laughs> yeah, so uh, climate change doesn't figure into a whole lot of classes that I teach directly. Uh, my colleague Craig uh, does a lot of those, but a lot of the tools that we've de developed here can be utilized for analyzing climate level data as well. So instead of using just the current weather data, we can use average data over, over periods of time to do that. And lots of, um, lots of climate researchers use Python extensively there as well. Obviously in our intro class, we cover a little bit of, of climate, um, but otherwise I, that is not the course I currently teach. Dan? Yeah. Big changes or improvements or additions for future Oh yeah, so um, things that are coming. Uh, we are looking to redo uh, how we process radar data uh, to make it more accessible for, for folks because that's been a challenge. That's what we just talked about on our call today. Um, there's always a list of lots of things to do. We want to be able to plot fronts. We currently can't do that uh, in GEMPAC. We want to automate some of the calculations so that you can just, in, especially the declarative syntax, just say, give me vorticity. And then it just gives you four to see. You don't have to actually do the calculation first to then calculate that. So again, we're trying to figure out ways to ease the burden because what we want to do is we want to allow scientists to do science. We don't necessarily need everybody to learn all the ins and outs of the programming because most of them just need to do a calculation to do the science, to understand something about the atmosphere. And that's what we're, we're attempting to do. So. You're involved in any uh, like training through webinars, YouTube group meetings and organizing those? Oh yes, very much so. So we have an upcoming uh, AMS uh, short course coming up. We've been doing one the past four or five years now, uh, where we'll exhibit uh, parts of the different different elements of the code. So one we uh, talked about declarative syntax. I think that was two years ago. I think that was January 2020, right before the pandemic, when we did a nice big one there to get people involved uh, in that code. So we do that. I currently serve on the Unidata Users Committee. I chair that committee, uh, which is uh, the organization that oversees all the projects that Unidata works on, including MetPy, and they do their own training as well. So uh, we had uh, we invited Unidata out in August of 2018, something like that, uh, to do a workshop here on campus where we had folks from Purdue, NIU, Central Michigan University, Northern Illinois University come in here uh, to learn about elements of MetPy to do that. So. Uh, we very much work to try to try to do that. One could imagine that the fees that are charged for things like that could help support future versions of the work. Is that part of the model? Um, in, yes and no. Um, we could potentially, but Unidata is NSF supported, uh, so that that's where then we get most of our funding there. But if they do work with private companies, that's where then they can fund some things there. Otherwise, uh, they're primarily here for for university. Um, processes, and they'll also work with the government closely because government funds them. So, uh, but then private sector, yeah, they've, they've done some poor pay um, kind of training sessions on all the different unit data technologies. So yeah. Anything else? Okay. So as a political scientist, I guess, uh, you know, uh, what is the most poignant question a lay person will ask I'll start with the second. So the question was, what is the most uh, uh, irritating question that meteorologists get and what is the most poignant, poignant, okay. Thought provoking, yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the one that's the uh, irritates probably the most is, do you believe in global warming? Another one is, so when am I gonna see you on TV? Um, let's see, another one is, um, what's the weather gonna be like tomorrow? When is the polar vortex, is the polar vortex coming? Yeah, yeah. Ever since 2014 and the polar vortex hit, the pol polar vortex is an ongoing thing that's always there. It's not a new phenomenon. And, yeah. Uh, poignant, um, yeah. Good one. 
I think when somebody's really trying to understand, they saw a phenomena, they saw something, and they just want to understand like what might be the cause of that. So whether it was like when they were flying, they saw like a, a, a glory outside the plane on the on the cloud or something like that, and to be able to explain how some of that that works, um, provided that they ask that they want to know how it works. Otherwise, sometimes I get asked a question and I go into professor mode and I start explaining when I don't need to be explaining. Anything else? Well, thank you again all so much for taking time out of your day, especially in December here. Um, I believe there is now cake across the street. So thank you all for being here.